The Jacksonian era, named after Andrew Jackson, represents one of the most dynamic and transformative periods in American history, spanning from the 1820s to the 1840s, which was marked by profound political realignments, significant economic developments, and social upheavals. During this era, the United States began to grapple with its identity as a nation, with issues ranging from the nature of democracy to the role of the federal government. The era also witnessed the rise of populism and an increasing emphasis on the role of the common man in American politics. In this lecture, we will explore the major political, economic and social shifts of the time, focusing on key events and figures that helped define this era, and we will examine their lasting impact on the development of the United States. But before we move on to discuss the Jacksonian era, we need to briefly discuss a few important events that happened immediately prior to the Jacksonian era. We will start with the Missouri Compromise and we will briefly talk about the Monroe Doctrine. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 was a pivotal moment in American history, representing the first major conflict over the issue of slavery since the founding of the United States. By 1890, the country was divided evenly between 11 free states and 11 slave states. The balance of power between these two factions was crucial, especially in the Senate, where each state, regardless of population, had two senators. The application of Missouri for statehood as a slave state threatened this delicate equilibrium, sparking furious debates over the future of slavery in the expanding territories of the United States. The crisis began when Representative James Talmadge of New York proposed amendments to Missouri statehood bill that would prohibit the further introduction of slaves and mandate gradual emancipation for those already enslaved. These amendments inflamed tensions between the North and the South. Many Northerners, while not uniformly uh, abolitionist, viewed the expansion of slavery as a moral and political issue. They were particularly frustrated by the South's disproportionate influence in national politics, which was bolstered by the three-fifth clause of the Constitution. This clause allowed southern states to count three-fifths of their enslaved populations for purposes of representation, giving the slaveholding South more seats in the House of Representatives than its free population alone would have justified. Southern leaders, on the other hand, saw the Talmadge amendments as a direct attack on their way of life and political power. They argued that the states, including newly admitted ones, should have the right to determine their own laws regarding slavery. For many in the South, the debate over Missouri was not just about the expansion of slavery, but also about states' rights and their ability to maintain parity with the increasingly industrialized North. The ferocity of the debate was shocking to many, with some politicians openly discussing the possibility of disunion and civil war if a compromise could not be reached. The crisis was ultimately resolved by the Missouri Compromise, brokered by Henry Clay. Missouri was admitted as a slave state, but to maintain the balance, Maine was admitted as a free state. More significantly, the compromise established the principle that slavery would be prohibited in all remaining territories of the Louisiana Purchase north of the 36th parallel line. Another important diplomatic development of that time was the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine, announced in 1823, marked a defining moment in the early development of American foreign policy. It was a bold declaration that asserted the United States' growing confidence on the global stage and its desire to protect the Western Hemisphere from European interference. The doctrine emerged in response to independence movement sweeping across Central and South America as former Spanish and Portuguese colonies sought to break free from European control. Inspired by the successful revolutions in the United States and France, these Latin American revolts alarmed European powers, particularly Spain, 
which sought to reassert control over its former territories. The United States, under the leadership of President James Monroe and Secretary of State John Adams, viewed this European interest with suspicion. A re-establishment of European colonies in the Americas would not only threaten U.S. influence in the region, but also limit the nation's economic opportunities for trade with newly independent Latin American states. Britain, which had significant commercial interest in Latin America, proposed a joint declaration with the, uh, with the United States to deter European intervention. However, Adams and Monroe believed that such a partnership would limit American autonomy and might make the U.S. appear subservient to British interests. Instead, in his annual message to Congress on December 2, 1823, Monroe articulated what became known as the Monroe Doctrine. The doctrine rested on two key principles. Non-colonization, that means the Western Hemisphere was no longer open to European colonization. Secondly, non-intervention. European powers were to refrain from interfering in the internal affairs of independent nations in the Americas. In return, the United States would abstain from involving itself in European conflicts. While the doctrine was primarily aimed at preventing European intervention in Latin America, it also had broader implications. It implicitly asserted that the United States should be the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere, laying the groundwork for future American interventions and territorial expansions. Though the U.S. at the time lacked the military strength to enforce the doctrine, it was effectively backed by Britain's powerful navy, which shared an interest in keeping European rivals out of Latin American markets. Over time, the Munro Doctrine evolved from a statement of principle into a cornerstone of American foreign policy. It was invoked to justify U.S. actions across the hemisphere, from the Mexican-American War to later interventions in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Central America. Initially symbolic, the doctrine reflected America's growing ambition and sense of responsibility as a protector of the Western Hemisphere. Now we will move on to the election of 1824. The election of 1824 is one of the most significant and controversial elections in the American history, signaling the end of the so-called era of good feelings and marking a pivotal shift in the nation's political landscape. With the Federalist Party having all but disappeared, the Democratic Republican Party was the dominant political force, but it was internally divided into competing factions. Unlike previous elections, where a clear candidate emerged from within the party, the 1824 election saw four major contenders, each representing different regions and interests within the country. John Quincy Adams, the son of former President John Adams and a highly respected diplomat, represented the interests of New England. Andrew Jackson, a war hero from Tennessee who had gained national fame after his victory at the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812, drew support from the South and West. William Crawford, the Secretary of the Treasury, had the backing of Southern Republicans and party insiders like Martin Van Buren. Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House, and an advocate for the American system represented the West and had long been a proponent of national economic development. The election revealed a growing rift between different sections of the country, North, South and West, each rallying behind its own candidate. Andrew Jackson, despite being a political outsider without formal education or elite connections, shocked the political establishment by winning the popular votes and electoral votes. However, he did not secure a majority of electoral votes, which meant the decision failed to the House of Representatives as required by the 12th Amendment. In the House, the top three candidates, Jackson, Adams and Crawford, were eligible for consideration. As a Speaker of the House, 
Henry Clay wielded considerable influence over the outcome. Clay, despite finishing fourth and being eliminated from contention, threw his support behind John Quincy Adams. When Adams won and subsequently appointed Clay as his Secretary of State, Jackson's supporters cried foul, accusing the two of making a corrupt bargain. This accusation of backroom deal-making tarnished Adams' presidency and fueled the rise of Jackson's populist movement, which would ultimately lead to the formation of the modern Democratic Party. After the contentious 1824 election, Andrew Jackson emerged as a powerful force in American politics. Fueled by widespread anger over the corrupt bargain that denied him the presidency despite his popular and electoral vote victories. Jackson spent the next four years preparing for a rematch in 1828, positioning himself as a champion of the common man against the entrenched political elite. His campaign, masterminded by key strategists like Martin Van Buren, revolutionized American politics by bypassing traditional party elites and appealing directly to the electorate. Jackson's populist message resonated with hundreds and thousands of voters, particularly in the South and West, who felt alienated by the elitist politics of the Adams administration. His image as a self-made man, a tough, unrefined frontiersman with a military background, made him a relatable figure to many Americans, particularly those who saw themselves as part of the working class. His election in 1828 was a landslide securing 56% of the popular vote and 176 of the 261 electoral votes. Once in office, Jackson set out to implement his vision of a government that truly reflected the will of the people. Central to his vision was his belief that government positions should not be held by an entrenched elite but should rotate regularly to prevent corruption and promote democracy. This philosophy gave rise to what became known as a spoiled system where Jackson replaced numerous government officials with loyal Democrats. Critics argued that this system promoted cronyism and sacrificed experience and competence for political loyalty, but Jackson defended it as a necessary reform to root out corruption. Jackson's presidency was also marked by his controversial Indian removal policy, one of the most significant and troubling aspects of his administration. For years, the federal government had sought to acquire Native American lands east of the Mississippi River, but Jackson's administration enhanced these efforts. Viewing Native American cultures as inferior and believing that their lands were better suited for white settlement, Jackson pushed for their removal to territories west of the Mississippi. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 authorized the president to negotiate treaties that would relocate Native American tribes to what is now Oklahoma. This policy primarily targeted the five civilized tribes, the Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaw, Chickasaws, and Seminoles, who had made significant adaptations to white culture, including establishing governments, written constitutions, and even newspapers. The Cherokees, in particular, sought to resist removal by legal means, taking their case to the Supreme Court. In Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, Chief Justice John Marshall ruled that the Cherokee Nation was a domestic dependent nation with limited rights. However, in a different case, in 1832, the court sided with the Cherokees, ruling that Georgia could not impose its laws on Cherokee land. Despite these legal victories, Jackson ignored the Supreme Court's decisions, famously stating, and I quote, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it, end of quote. This defiance of the court led to the enforcement of the Treaty of New Echota in 1835, which mandated the removal of the Cherokees from their land. The forced relocation, known as the Trail of Tears, resulted in the deaths of nearly one-fourth of the Cherokee population as they were marched to Indian territory under brutal conditions. Jackson's Indian removal policy set a tragic precedent for the future dealings with Native American tribes, leading to their near-total displacement from the eastern United States.
Jackson's approach to economic policy was deeply influenced by his suspicion of concentrated power, especially when it appeared to benefit uh, the wealthy at the expense of ordinary Americans. One of the most significant battles of his presidency was the conflict over the Second Bank of the United States, known as the Bank War. The bank, established in 1816, played a crucial role in stabilizing the national economy by regulating currency and providing loans to smaller state banks. Its president, Nicholas Biddle, was committed to maintaining a sound financial system through the bank's control over credit and currency circulation. However, many Americans, including Jackson and his supporters, viewed the bank as an institution that primarily served the interest of the wealthy elite. Jackson described the bank as a monster and a hydra of corruption, accusing it of manipulating credit, uh, uh, credit and currency for the benefit of a privileged few. He was particularly critical of the bank's use of paper money, which he believed fueled inflation and speculation, thereby hurting farmers and laborers who relied on stable prices for their crops and goods. Jackson favored a currency backed by gold and silver as a means of protecting the economy from the volatility of paper money. In 1832, Congress passed a bill to renew the bank's charter, which was set to expire in 1836. Jackson, however, vetoed the bill, delivering a scathing message that attacked the bank's special privileges and argued that its existence was unconstitutional despite earlier Supreme Court rulings that upheld its legitimacy. Jackson's veto message resonated with many Americans, particularly those in South and West, who felt that the bank represented the interests of a wealthy Northeastern elite. His veto became a central issue in the 1832 presidential election, helping him secure a resounding victory against his opponent Henry Clay. After winning re-election, Jackson escalated the bank war by ordering the withdrawal of federal deposits from the bank and distributing them to smaller state banks, known as paid banks. This move crippled the bank as the federal government had been uh, its uh, largest customer. Critics accused Jackson of overstepping his authority and violating the bank's charter while prominent politicians like Clay warned that Jackson's actions threatened to concentrate too much power in the presidency. The removal of federal deposits sparked economic chaos. Biddle responded by tightening credit, leading to a credit crunch that caused widespread economic hardship. Businesses struggled to secure loans and many were forced to lay off workers or reduce their operations. Despite the public outcry, Jackson remained resolute, insisting that the bank, not his policies, was responsible for the economic pain. The bank war also had significant political consequences. Jackson's aggressive stance against the bank galvanized his opponents, who began to coalesce into a new political party known as the Whigs. Named after a historical faction, that opposed monarchical power, the Whigs accused Jackson of acting like a tyrant and violating the principles of Republican governance. The Whig party attracted a diverse coalition of national Republicans, nullifiers and pro-bank Democrats who sought to counter Jackson's populist policies and restore a more balanced approach to government and economy. The bank war also increased political engagement among ordinary Americans. Voter participation skyrocketed during this period, rising from about 25% of eligible voters in the 1824 presidential election to nearly 78% by 1840. This surge in political involvement reflected the growing interest in national politics and highlighted how the bank war mobilized voters to express their opinions on economic issues. Another major crisis during Jackson's presidency was the tariff controversy, which culminated in the nullification crisis of early 1830s. The roots of the conflict lay in the protective tariffs implemented by Congress designed to shield northern manufacturers from European competition. 
These tariffs benefited the North where industrialization was taking root but deeply unpopular in the South where planters relied on the export of cotton to foreign markets. Southern leaders, particularly in South Carolina, argued that the tariff unfairly increased the cost of imported goods while benefiting northern industries. The most controversial of these tariffs was the Tariff of 1828, which southern critics dubbed the Tariff of Abominations. Southern planters, especially those in South Carolina, believed that the tariff placed an unjust economic burden on their region. They also feared that if the federal government could impose economic policies that harmed the South, it might one day interfere with the institution of slavery which was central to the Southern economy and way of life. Jackson, a Southern cotton planter himself, was sympathetic to the economic flight of the South but was committed to preserving the Union. His vice president, John Calhoun, who had initially supported the tariffs, became the leading advocate for nullification. The idea that states had the right to nullify federal laws they deemed unconstitutional. Calhoun, in an anonymous publication known as the South Carolina Exposition and Protest, articulated the theory of nullification, arguing that constitution was a compact between sovereign states and that states could refuse to enforce federal laws that overstepped the powers granted to the federal government. In 1832, South Carolina held a state convention and officially declared the tariffs of 1828 and 1832 null and void within the state. This act of defiance created a constitutional crisis as South Carolina openly challenged the authority of the federal government. Jackson, who loathed the idea of nullification as a threat to the Union, responded forcefully. In a proclamation to the people of South Carolina, he denounced nullification as treason and threatened to use military force to ensure that federal laws were enforced. This crisis was eventually diffused by a compromise brokered by Henry Clay, who proposed a gradual reduction of tariffs over the next decade. Congress passed the Compromise Tariff of 1833 alongside the Force Bill which authorized the president to use military force to enforce federal laws. While South Carolina backed down from its nullification of the tariffs, it symbolically nullified the force bill, though this gesture was largely ignored by the rest of the country. The nullification crisis was a significant moment in the ongoing debate over states' rights and federal authority, foreshadowing the more serious conflicts that would erupt over slavery in the coming decades. The Jacksonian era also saw the rise of abolitionist movement, as a growing number of Americans began to question the morality and legality of slavery. The movement was fueled by evangelical religious fervor, as many abolitionists saw the fight against slavery as a moral crusade. The American Anti-Slavery Society, founded in 1833 by William Lloyd Garrison and other abolitionists, sought to mobilize public opinion against slavery through the use of petitions, literature, and public lectures. Abolitionists faced fierce opposition from pro-slavery advocates, particularly in the South, where the institution of slavery was seen as essential to the economic and social order. Southern politicians worked to suppress the abolitionist movement using legal means such as the gag rule, which was implemented by Congress in the mid-1830s to prevent the discussion of anti-slavery petitions on the floor of the House of Representatives. The gag rule illustrated the lengths to which Southern leaders were willing to go to silence dissent and protect the institution of slavery. The abolitionist movement also faced challenges from within. While some abolitionists, like Garrison, called for immediate emancipation and uncompromising moral reform, others favored a more gradual approach or sought to address the issue of slavery through political compromise. This division within the mo movement mirrored the broader sectional divide in the United States as the nation grappled with the future of slavery. 
Despite these challenges, the evolutionist movement made significant strides during the Jacksonian era, laying the foundation for the eventual emancipation of enslaved people during the Civil War. The movement also intersected with other reform movements of the time, including the women's rights movement and the temperance movement as activists sought to address broader issues of social justice and equality.